uh, very exciting agenda today uh, and thanks folks for joining in um uh, Dhanesh, first off, uh, you know, would love to learn a little bit more about what Mosaic Wellness does um, and, and the journey for the company uh, so far. Uh, maybe we can start with that. Sure, sure. Happy to take you through this. Uh, one small disclaimer, I have a cough and cold, so pardon me for the occasional sneeze or cough here and there that might happen over the next few minutes. Uh, so, yeah, so so uh, Ankur, we are, we are uh, now a three-plus-year-old uh, health tech platform. What we do at Mosaic Wellness is we are building uh, full stack uh, health and wellness platforms that helps consumers solve for elective health. And maybe I'll spend just a minute diving into one or two of the buzzwords I use here. So what the platform does is maybe more clear. What we mean by elective health here is think of uh, healthcare problems, which are uh, clearly perceptible and visible to consumers, but at the same time, they're not at a level of seriousness which could for example kill you or debilitate your your lifestyle in a significant way uh, i'm talking of areas such as for example skin health hair health sexual health sleep disorders and so on high incidence problems but which most often end up going uh, untreated or uncared for given our healthcare system the way it's set up is actually more set up to deal with both acute and very severe chronic disorders and we've been trying to use the second buzzword I use, which was full stack health platforms, is mm -hmm. we're trying to use, create digital health platforms that can help consumers solve for this. And how we do that is a, by using a combination of uh, curated content, uh, communities, um, consultation, and products. Uh, through uh, the content that we have on the platform, the communities of users which we have created who have like-minded uh, areas to discuss. Uh, consultations with experts on the platform and specific products uh, curated to help uh, alleviate or solve for those problems. So that's what we've been building. We run uh, three platforms <coughs> catering to three different uh, uh, segments of consumers. Uh, Man Matters uh, being the first one that we started three years ago, catering to men's health. Uh, Be Body Wise, which caters to women's elective health and Little Joys, which uh, caters to uh, health healthcare needs of uh, children. So that's what we've been doing. It's been about uh, three plus years. We started around the time uh, uh, COVID hit us. Uh, so it was kind of a, a memorable start. And here we are now. So so yeah, that's I, I hope that gives a broad uh, explanation of what we do as a business. No, absolutely. Um, yeah. And and um uh, you know being born out of covid uh, i'm sure would have been an interesting journey and uh, like many great businesses which come out of recessions and uh, you know adversity you know we're very excited to see how mosaic has been shaping up from the sidelines uh, fantastic danish and you know um a lot of our audience of course comes from the finance uh, you know uh, domain right uh, would be great if you could actually shed some light on how do you think about the finance function in the context of um, building a business, um, you know, like Mosaic and and especially given that it's a high growth business and, you know, you guys are scaling fast, um, you know, you've, you've been taking charge of the finance function apart from the other functions. Um, what's been your sort of take on how finance is contributing to business? Sure, sure. So I think one... Uh... Uh, uh, thing that might make me different from not all, but most of the participants uh, on this session is I'm actually not a, a trained and tenured finance professional. Uh, uh, I'm not a, I'm not an accountant. I'm not a CA. Uh, in fact, I never studied commerce. Uh, and I, I kind of think of uh, Mosaic as my fifth career, not my fifth job, because I started off in technology as an engineer, uh, then went into uh, consulting at McKinsey like yourself, uh, I did a startup after that in the manufacturing space uh, and then investing uh, in private equity, which is, you, you could say it's finance, but it's not accounting. It's not really a process. It's more uh, a business uh, before we started this. So so going into Mosaic Wellness, while I uh, spend a lot of my time on finance, uh, my mindset tends to be more oriented towards the business side uh, than towards the accounting side. Thankfully, we've had a great team uh, uh, on finance at our side to help balance this, this dichotomy. But as we think about finance, um, I think um, 
you know, one of my very uh, close friends works at uh, at Unilever at finance, and and she always tells me what makes finance great at Unilever is is the fact that it makes the company so predictable. Uh, so today, uh, chances are for next quarter and for next year, the projections that Unilever has put out, chances are they're not going to be off by more than one percent. Uh, and when I say off, I mean either side, not necessarily just down, even up. Uh, and that is the level of planning that goes into uh, that setup, which has, of course, been well-oiled over 100 years. It's not something that they've built overnight. Uh, but when you have strong controls and predictability in place, it actually gives the business a very different dynamic altogether. A, it allows you to scale fearlessly because what very often happens is there are business opportunities that you see. The opportunity looks great. You will jump at it and only then realize that, hey, 20 things are breaking on the back end uh, because of this. Second, what very often happens, and we, I mean, I think we've seen it in our early days, not so much now. Uh, you, 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 are, you see some opportunity, you move towards it and you realize that, hey, this works well, but there are 20 other dependencies that that fail when, when you go and opt for that. And I think a strong function on the finance side gives you both, I think, a, a, a peace of mind of knowing that there's a strong governance in place, that nothing's going wrong, and B, it gives the business side of the of the company an ability to execute fearlessly, knowing that everything else is getting taken care of. Uh, yeah. Which is why we've invested quite heavily in this function over time. It's been quite a journey. It's not like we've started with uh, uh, the nth level of processes and systems, but I think we are now getting there uh, over time. Yeah. Sorry, am I audible? I think my video froze. Wait, wait. You're yes, audible. you're. Okay. Okay. Um, no, that's, uh, you know, I love that perspective um, of bringing, you know, the role of finance, bringing <laughs> predictability to business and allowing you to scale uh, rapidly and fearlessly. I think that's a great articulation, uh, which is very, you know, almost counterintuitive um, to how a lot of businesses in India have been built um you know across manufacturing and across some of the other segments right where um yes you know controls are put into the extent possible but you know finance is often an overlooked function to some extent um you know the amount of investments that go into finance are never treated at par with you know the amount of investments that would go into some of the other functions which are more revenue driving for instance uh, so when you say that, um, you know, you guys have invested a lot in, in finance, um, you know, it, I would imagine it's a, you know, it's, it's slightly different as a perspective compared to a lot of companies, you know, who, who are, you know, who grew over the last two, you know, one to two decades, um, you know, talk a little bit about what prompted this, you know, thinking, was it something that you guys had, you know, envisaged right from day one? Was it a learning that happened? Did something change on ground that, you know, prompted you to sort of say, hey, you know, we need to build, you know, predictability in the in the business and hence we need to start into investing in finance uh, as an org? Yeah, so I think it has been a bit of a journey. And uh, in, in my mind, you know, when you compare, you, you made an interesting comparison that you said manufacturing companies who have been built over decades. Uh, I actually think for some of those, not necessarily all, it might be okay to be more measured in how they invest in this function. Uh, the reason some others like us have to is because, uh, you know, it's it's a very interesting dichotomy. Uh, in a young startup, which is growing fast, hyper growth is the dream of the business team. And it is the nightmare of the finance team. Because what what happens, right? Like like if you look at us, we are a three in a way we are a three year old company, three and a half year old company. So mm -hmm. there is one view to say, hey, it's just three three and a half years. So you're still early. You are allowed to not have the best systems and processes because it's barely been a few years. You're allowed to make mistakes. But the contra view is, oh, okay, you're who cares about how old you are? The fact is that you have so many hundreds of crores of revenue. The fact is that you're doing so many thousands of orders a day and that you have so many channels and you have so many geographies and you are potentially looking to maybe even go public in X number of years or you have in XYZ number of investors. You have a, now a large team. So the oversight that a few people have, which you earlier had when you were small, is now dwindling by the day. So yeah. all of 
and then you realize that hey you don't have a choice the if if you were to grow very slowly uh very basic process can actually keep uh pace with where you are yeah. contrary to that if you have hyper growth which is the best problem a company should have uh out of all the problems that's the one i want to deal with uh which is where you need to invest yeah both in terms of team and in terms of systems and processes so and we've we've seen that transition right like when we started uh, around the covid time uh, i mean i would be honest to say that we had barely little process like whatever the finance process was was in a way me because i was approving every payment i was getting everything through and uh, we did not have maybe the best of documentation because i almost didn't see the need for it because the control was close to 100% i knew every vendor i knew every transaction that was happening um but then if i see the transition very quickly we got a uh, a, a proper finance team in place uh, they started taking care of payments very quickly we got a great senior team in place on the business side uh, controls moved to them they were approving uh, transactions at their end uh, they were taking care of spends taking uh, calls uh, there were specific budgets allocated there were specific approval limits allocated to each person those limits would be different for different teams uh, on the bank side transaction limits would be different for different teams uh, i don't have now direct view uh on each and every transaction that is happening across the company so all of a sudden you realize damn this would break and this is not to say that you know there are crooks out there in the company who would do something wrong i don't think that's the yeah. the concern of course that can happen of course that can happen but it's not just about it's also about having controls in place so that you know that all the spends that are happening are in line with the planning so we have a aop we have an annual plan the annual plan splits from annual into months that plan splits into separate expense heads uh, each expense head is owned by a different person in the company how does that all piece together such that we are not going off as an organization uh, i think the only solution then is trying to to start with first step was put processes in place with uh, without automation i would say and then when that also got Uh, too large to handle then to get try and get automation in place where you are effectively no longer dependent on people to make sure compliance is happening instead it's systems which are making sure co- compliance is happening and effectively and that effectively makes it uh, uh, error free assuming the systems are set up correctly of course yeah. it makes it error free uh, uh, i think it gives me a lot of peace of mind uh, knowing that everything is uh, tracked through a system where um, at least uh, goof ups don't happen we also have uh an issue of transparency right earlier when we were operating on email based approval systems uh some payment might not have happened because xyz person who has the approval authority has not approved it yet but does everyone in the system know that okay, this is why it is stuck mm-hmm. uh and not just everyone in the system even the external party right vendor does not have any update ki mera payment hua hai nahi hua hai what is the utr etc so that whole transparency again which never was a problem earlier because the volume was so small so kind of everyone knew everything now it's uh, uh, getting a lot more complex we do we do approximately now 1000 payments a month so it's impossible for anyone even the person handling payments in the finance team can't be on top of all of them it's just practically yeah. not possible yeah that that's a very interesting uh, thing and and you know personally we face that a bit here at cashbo as well you know every time a payment would you know have to be <laughs> you know made we'd have to first check with each individual though have you approved it have you checked it and there was this loop that would get created uh but when there is a system in place you know that if it's come for a final payment all the necessary checks have happened and all the you know approvals are in place and you talked about peace of mind right which is interesting it's great for you but i'm sure even for your team they have peace of mind as well knowing that the people before them have done their job and it's all there on a system for you know for you know sort of for posterity so to speak right so uh have you seen that like i'd love to get a perspective on how your teams have perceived uh you know digitization as a as a theme because you know we've often seen two two views right when it comes to automation or digitization uh one is you know is the cost justified right should we just run manually we've been doing it up until now we can do it going forward and the second view is uh, you know the teams tend to be a bit hesitant because you know at some level you know they feel is it treading on their territory right so 
you know a did you encounter those challenges in your own thought process in your team's thought process and b how are the teams perceiving you know digitization i think that's been a mixed bag to be honest uh, <laughs> because um, i think it has been uh, i think it's it is very well received by the finance team for example because uh, it was just going out of hand where everything was manual or on google sheets uh, uh and and now at least it's fully tracked in a system aging is visible you know what's due what's not everything is pretty well organized <laughs> so i think it makes their job a lot easier and especially now when we've not done it yet but at any point we are going to have live integration between the system and tally which means even uh pushing entries for each expense into the system into the accounting system will uh, get automated so that would actually make their life a lot easier so i think that's that's gone off very well for the business users i think it's been a mixed bag uh so a uh, at first when we were transitioning uh it was actually i think quite hard um and and i think like my, my learning looking back was if anyone is implementing a system of this nature need to very quickly identify the owners of the system the champions of the system empower them to push it through because um Uh, for two reasons a uh, put asking for a request on a email is actually the easiest thing for anyone to do <laughs> so now versus that to log into a platform and follow a bit of structure is is obviously not great for anyone uh, so so that's that's one kind of uh, uh, pushback you get to some extent uh, and especially in the early bit um, when you're transitioning from the earlier setup to this and the second is um once we have already done and people have been trained um the fact that now um uh, the accountability of each step is very clear it actually exposes sometimes folks who are not doing their job properly uh, which is great right um like you would know very quickly through the system that hey you know this team ka invoices have uh, xyz loopholes in a high percentage of cases and this one does not and so on so uh, but that's great because i think earlier we did not have this kind of data and trackability earlier it was a bunch of emails and google sheets so in a way uh, as we are scaling this is good it just creates the transparency it creates a little bit of back and forth but i think we'll just settle into it uh, slowly it's like it's taken longer than we thought right we thought we will get through in less than 3 months i think it's taken us 6 months and we're still not fully through so I mean, one of the learning is this just takes time as much as you uh, push it through yeah it takes time and and there are high stakes at at play right because you're talking about large values of invoices and purchases so you cannot even just shove it through <laughs> go through the motions one by one yeah and and you know when you reflect on um you know why uh, you all embarked on the digitization journey or the automation journey um i'm sure there would have been certain you know goals that you had in mind right like what was the so you mentioned one of the triggers was um you know reducing the dependency on you know manual processes while the processes were there but you wanted you know it to be system driven that allowed for peace of mind um but you know at the beginning you also talked about bringing predictability in forecasting and how finance can sort of contribute to business does automation sort of um in any way contribute to building greater predictability um uh, you know on that aspect so it does it does like um, effectively if we have to be more predictable as a business if we have to have better planning as a business uh planning is actually a function of how strong your past data is um uh, you cannot do any planning for the future if your past is not clear so i think any planning starts with how accurate your past data is um and when i say it's not actually just accurate it's also how rich the past data is so like for i mean just to very simply to say that okay your purchases are x crores per month is accurate but that's not rich data for planning uh, versus to say that okay it's so much it is this much by each vendor this is the aging this is how the credit profile is panning out etc is far more useful for for uh, uh, your future planning so i think in a way 
having this has helped us uh, get more granular in what we can plan for the future. I think it'll get a lot better because as of now, we've not moved our entire expense base to the platform today. Some some of our teams are on the platform. Some of them are not yet on it, which we will probably do over a period of time. So in that in in that way, it's it's made planning a lot better. It's made transparency a lot better uh, because every team now knows what is happening uh, to their payments. Where is it stuck? Uh, even if it is stuck, even if finance end it's stuck, then even that is also visible or it's stuck at some business end. Uh, the partners who are getting paid are getting their updates so they know QTR Agia and not so on. That was one of the most dreaded tasks for a finance team was sharing UTRs. Uh, so that kind of gets solved. So yeah, in a way, I think it's moved a lot. But on the planning front, it's just helped in getting us more granular and accurate data uh, on our uh, cost base, which earlier was again lying more in spreadsheets uh, than in systems. Yeah. You know, that's it. one of the conversations I was having with, a, you know, very large company, billion dollar plus, uh, while they would have a view on their overall sort of, you know, payables and receivables uh, and, you know, the broad aging. Um, but, you know, they never had a view on how to improve uh, their working capital cycle, especially on the payable side, because the next level of granularity to say for which segment of vendors what is the actual period for payments versus what is the stated period on on paper? That level of granularity was very hard to sort of uh, determine. Um, uh, and then, like you know, over time, as you start seeing your own payment behavior at a very granular vendor level, in you know, data invoice level data, um, you know, you can start identifying pockets of optimization around. Uh, okay, you know, the, these are the segments where you know we have the right kind of payable uh, credit periods and. Here are segments where there could be, you know, ways of improving it. I, I don't know if, you know, that level of granularity and visibility was there earlier uh, for you guys. Um, did, did, is this sort of helping, you know, achieve some of those goals? So, you know, maybe specific to us, uh, from day zero, we've been pushing a culture of very high uh, granularity on data. Uh, so we did have these views. Uh the only caveat is again all spreadsheets. Uh, so then sometimes, sometimes you would realize, hey, there is a human error somewhere, someplace, uh, right? Which happens, which I, I, I think it happens to any of us. I, have, I, I do it too. Uh, so just pushing from the spreadsheets to the systems has kind of helped increase accuracy. Yeah. Uh, uh, but for us as an org, there was something we were already doing uh, yeah. the way we were set up. Yeah. Got it. Um, and you sort of reflect on how your teams have evolved, right? Um, because, I mean, there would have been a certain set of jobs and tasks that, you know, your purchase team, your finance team was doing, let's say the pre-digitization period. And now with the systems in place, you know, has their role evolved or graduated to doing something different, something more? Because that's, again, a question that a lot of companies have is um you know how can digitization really help um you know finance elevate itself uh, do you see that playing out uh i think um i think it will in the future i think right now because we've just gone live in the last quarter we're actually doubling up where we are having the checks uh, yeah. again on the finance end the difference is again the checks are now on the system versus on emails so we, what we are definitely seeing is the oops moments are not happening you know the, the email just fell through the cracks mm -hmm. uh, or you know this is stuck and no one knows why it is stuck and then you dig in and realize Asha, this person did not approve it uh, on time and so on so that is eliminated for us uh, altogether uh, uh the the other issue which we used to have is mismatches which is eliminated like when we procure anything we will have a purchase order we'll have an invoice and we'll have a goods receipt at our at our premises at our warehouses uh uh make getting all three of them aligned making sure there is no mismatch or if there is a mismatch the mismatch is documented and approved that again is eliminated uh mm -hmm. we had an issue with earlier so i think the process quality governance predictability 
impact is very clear. The impact on productivity of the team, I, I, I feel we'll see the impact, but we'll have to see it in the next uh, three to six months as we kind of fully rely onto the system, which we're not yet moved to. Just being prudent here because, again, yeah. large transactions, large purchases. So uh, we want to make sure we transition slowly over time. But should digitization, in your view, be a you know a productivity related argument, <laughs> or do you like? I mean, uh, you know, again, uh, you know, sort of a lot of finance folks are by design trained to be cost conscious, right? Which is and is the right thing to do as well. Uh, but then you know, digitization starts getting measured on um, you know whether are we driving enough productivity by digitizing. Um, how would you frame the argument for digitization? Is is productivity one of your top levers for doing it? Or do you feel there is already enough value coming out of some of the other aspects you spoke about, which is governance, controls, peace of mind, so on and so forth? I think for me, for me, productivity would, I think it'll play out productivity, but it's not a top lever for me. Uh, uh, because I don't think like AP processing is a massive cost base for us. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, it's a, uh, of course, any any cost saved is is good, but AP processing by itself is not the biggest uh, thing on my mind from a cost perspective. I, I think the cost saving might come from elsewhere actually, which is stemming leakages. Mm -hmm. So for example, uh, if I have a delta between my PO price and invoice price, um, uh, if that is flagged by the system and yeah. on flagging, there is a very high chance that it's actually a justified Delta in which case it will get approved with the exception, uh, which is documented, but if it's not, which yeah. happens now and then again, not, it doesn't happen because someone's trying to swindle you. There are just natural human errors that happen. Now, when you catch those kind of things, that's a saving. It's not coming in the headcount uh, bit, but it's a saving still for the company overall when it comes to that. Uh, uh, Similarly, when it just comes to stronger corporate governance, as you get larger and larger, you want to make sure that everything is well documented. There's nothing slipping through the cracks. Uh, there is no human dependency on some of these checks and balances. So that's, again, something which is panning out quite well. Um, productivity may be improvement, but I don't think top lever uh, in my mind. Yeah, and that's fair. Uh, and as far as... Um... Uh, you know, your vendor communication is concerned, you know, you talked about how, you know, conveying simple things like even a UTR would be a challenge. Yeah. Um, has that process sort of, you know, improved over the past few months? Um, how is How are your teams perceiving that? That's become a lot better. I would say actually the UTR bit is actually not a challenge. It's an irritant. Uh, actually, if you think about it, kaam kuch nahi hai. it's such a simple thing. Like someone is just pull a, a 16 digit number and send it across, right? It's not, a, <laughs> it's very far from what I would call a challenge. But the problem is these are irritants. These are irritants which, you know, if someone has got a, a well-planned eight-hour day, ki mujhe ye ye karna hai. and in that eight-hour day, if that one-minute irritant comes in between, it just messes up the day. So I, I think these kind of things help in just making sure people focus on value additive work and move away from work which actually should not be done by any human being. So so I think that's helped and 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 vendors are happy, right? Because the moment the payment is happening, they're getting intimated, uh, which earlier would happen when like A, the business team would not know when the payment has happened because uh, business team would have raised the request when it finally gets approved on the bank portal is something which they would not have a view on. When it does happen, then it'll get processed at some point. The finance team will pick it up, send it to the our business team, which would then at some point send it to the uh, uh, actual partner who was supposed to be paid. Um, so so that that whole time lag is eliminated in a way. So uh, it, I think it works quite well. Uh, almost all of our uh, uh, partners are quite happy uh, with this setup. Got it. You know, sort of, want to get a little more tactical right for you know benefit of uh, the audience um you know when finance uh, leaders or business leaders um think about digitization um first of all what is a good time you know or when should they start thinking about this for their business is there a right time and b um what should they be you know what what should they be keeping in mind 
when uh, taking up such projects i think i think the first uh, i think the first step is to not set the target as i want to digitize i think the first step should be absolute clarity on what is the problem i'm facing which needs a solution uh, because that problem might be different for everyone right like like you mentioned like productivity is that the problem which for me it was not or is it uh, uh, governance is it compliance is it uh, uh, getting a specific type of check in place uh, uh, they could or is it optimizing working capital uh, it could that that's something which also helped because now we're through the system we're able to set future dates very efficiently we used to do that earlier also but again all manual now this is something which we can do through system so so these kind of like what is the core problem to solve should be very clear like i would actually encourage people to write it down ki aap likh lo ki you know this is my one problem or maybe two three problems if not one uh once you written it down i would say step one should be does it does it require a system to solve or does it just require a process to solve and they are both different uh yeah. in a very very early stage a system might be overkill for that matter uh so i would think carefully ke acha if this is my problem is it because i have a crap process uh or i have not thought it through i have not put the right person behind it or is it actually now too big to solve and getting that clarity and once the clarity is that this is actually now large enough where it requires a system solution then going for that i would say again something we did i don't know right or wrong our biggest criteria when we were trying to uh, uh, once you decide that you need a system here um the next question obviously is whom to go with which is a very complicated question to answer um because there's not like there's one uh, great solution out there and everything else is is bad um uh, uh figuring out that and the criteria like for us one of the big criteria as ankur you are aware is we like uh, again i think one of the mistakes a lot of companies make is you adopt a system which ends up defining the process versus finding a system that adopts your process uh i don't want to change the way 300 people in a company operate um uh, uh, because i got a new system in place ideally uh, uh, unless of course the my existing process is crap which is a different scenario but assuming the existing process okay you need to find a system which means so so what is the like spending some time to be very clear that out of all the partners that you could choose who's able to really give you something that will slip in easily into your existing processes and systems um which was a challenge for us because we wanted the system to be integrated with our warehouse management system where all our purchases inwards etc happen so that so i think being very careful about whom you select such that you are comfortable that these people will be able to deliver something that will work for my people and my processes and my needs and not just going for like whatever is a known name uh so that's something to be very careful about and last is knowing fully well that the implementation is going to be somewhat painful so have champions in place who are empowered to do this and who have the bandwidth to do this because in the early days it does take some time to push this through of course then it gets very smooth and it gives a lot of comfort once it is done but that's yeah. what if i look back at our last 6 months on this journey that's what i think uh, i would advise others who are who are looking at this yeah no that's awesome and uh, you know we'll probably uh, pause in a couple of minutes for any q and a but before we do that you know would love for you to talk about you know just to sort of you know summarize this whole thing right what was the you know process before you digitized uh, your ap function um you know if you can visual help the people visualize what it was earlier and what it is today i think that'll really um you know help bring this to life sure sure so i'm going to skip the part in the early part of our company's journey when we were really small but if i just say 6 months prior and 6 months post um so what we were doing earlier is um for we had um, approvals in place with each of our business leaders on what expenses uh, they can do to what amount and so on um they would effectively uh, raise purchases at their end it would get approved based on uh, hierarchies uh, all of this was over email um and 
uh, as and when the goods or services are delivered, the payment request would again get raised, which would again be over email. Uh, of course, the, te the finance team would transcribe it all into specific Google Sheets where we would maintain the tabular data. Um, uh, and and yeah, and and for for goods, physical goods, which would actually get delivered to one of our warehouses, it would again get verified against the uh, actual goods received note uh, at the warehouse. Uh, so that's how this whole process would work. Earlier. And that process was, you know, the matching of PO, GRN, invoice. How was that happening at that time? Uh, uh, all manual uh, in that case. Uh, mm. And actually, we were not, yeah, it was it was all manual. And um, um, the again, the POs were also raised on a separate system at that point of time. So it was not even one system uh, that we had. So so actually, if I think about it, process was exactly the same uh, as we have today, uh, but it was different systems and very manual. Um, <laughs> and the issue with manual is as volume grows, there tend to be slippages um, there. Uh, and, and which is what I was saying, like we wanted a system which could map our process and not vice versa. So what we got in effectively is doing the same thing but it's just all automated. We have OCR in place to read the invoices. Uh, we have the checks being done automatically. We have uh, tolerances which have been put in. So we have a allowable tolerance between PO and invoice value, which can get auto approved versus one which is uh, beyond that, which again goes into its own approval workflow and so on. So um, uh, the payments are now automated. So uh, as in when we approve the payments on uh, on the system, the bank payments get pushed through automatically, uh, which also cuts one leg earlier that we had, which is getting each of the payments approved separately, both on the on email and then on the bank portal. So that's that's kind of combined into one step, which helps. Uh, and the visibility helps because now anyone who's raising a payment can log in and see A, whether it's happened or not. Uh, actually, they would know if it's happened because they would have gotten the intimation already. But if it's not happened, why has it not happened? Where is it stuck? Uh, is it approval? Or is it stuck with finance for some reason? Or is there a discrepancy? Right, once in a while, uh, there is a error in what you have asked for versus what uh, 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 the documentation that has been submitted. Yeah, yeah. <clears throat> got it. Oh, very helpful, Dhanesh. Um, uh, this has been super insightful, by the way. So you know, thanks, thanks again. Um, uh, any final sort of thoughts on? Um, uh, you know the you know your experience with cash flow overall and um anything that you'd want to share with the audience before we open it up for q a uh yeah so we've had a great experience which is why i'm here uh so uh it's been a great experience for us i think i think for us the single biggest uh, positive has been the ability to get the system to map our processes and not vice versa uh, I would be very wary of getting something that just tinkers with our processes in a significant way. And we've been able to get that support from the team to make that happen. I, I Obviously, I guess part of it is also that you're not sitting on a legacy solution created 10 years ago. Uh, so you have that benefit over some of the legacy guys uh, in a way. And us being a relatively early client also, I guess we had an ability to work more closely with you together. But I think that part has been great and we've like we've been able to integrate it with all of our internal systems now, which is where the, I think the magic happens there. Uh, getting another system which operates in isolation, uh, you know, to your point on productivity, it actually might become counterproductive. Um, yeah. uh, if a system comes in, jo, just becomes a workflow for approvals and everything else remains separate. Um, uh, so that's something which we managed to avoid. Otherwise, I think, yeah, we've been, uh, we're very glad that we made this choice when we were considering various alternatives. Got it. Thank you so much, Dhanesh. Uh, and thanks uh, again for taking our time for this webinar. Um, I hope the audience found this helpful. Uh, we'll, of course, share recordings, a post, but uh, perhaps now, you know, we're happy to open it up for Q&A. If there are any questions, uh, happy to take um, from the audience. Uh, Radhika, do you want to share some of the questions that we've received so far? Uh, so we'll be uh, sharing the questions now. So Akshay, if you could unmute the participants who posted the question uh, so that they can ask the questions themselves. 
Yeah, just um, one second. We have uh, one question from Mr. Sunil. So, Mr. Sunil, if you could just uh, ask the question yourself. I think maybe he is not available right now, but basically his question was around uh, yeah. was around uh, how cash flow is different from an ERP. Um, specifically, you know, if there are uh, dashboards or services which cash flow offers, uh, which are not in an ERP, right? Today, so maybe Ankur, do you want to take this up first, and then Dhanesh, uh, if you want to add on anything? Yeah, yeah. So I think think of us as a you know a layer on top of. Uh, an ERP. Um, our job kind of begins where the ERP's job ends in many ways. Um, so, you know, for instance, today cash flow works with, you know, not just with a tally accounting system or a warehouse management system like a uh, unicommerce or uh, a viniculum, but, you know, we work with SAP as an ERP at the back, Oracle, Microsoft, so on and so forth. Um, so, you know, we bring in that added layer that today is missing in an ERP, whether it is, you know, let's say capturing a physical invoice into a digital form um, and then pushing that information into the ERP or, you know, whether it is doing external, let's say, compliance checks with regards to GST of vendors um, and, uh, you know, handling payments, for instance, where when payments are released to the vendors, uh, eventually they need to go back into the ERP so reconciling those entries and in, back into ERP. So, you know, we are, uh, the, the platform acts as, uh, you know, a partner to the ERP and does things that an ERP doesn't typically do uh, and uh, essentially complements uh, the capabilities of a typical ERP, right? So uh, that's how, you know, I would put, I would put this. Super. Super. Uh, we actually have a related question from Mr. Sanjay. Uh, Mr. Sanjay, I'm just going to unmute you. Maybe you can ask your question yourself, right? Uh, one sec. Yeah. Uh, Mr. Sanjay, are you there? Hello. Yes. Yeah, I was asking, uh, you know, rather uh, willing to know how this vendor reconciliation is handled. Sorry, how uh, this yes. reconciliation is handled? I think it's about the invoice reconciliation for the vendors. Yeah, right? invoice reconciliation. Got it. Um, Janesh, do you want to take that perhaps? Or do you want me to take it? Well, for us, we we manage reconciliations with each uh, party on a monthly basis. Uh, and then we, we tend to close on a quarterly basis with each and every vendor. Uh, I don't think our process for reconciliation has actually changed meaningfully uh, with this because uh, our reconciliation process is more mapped to our accounting system uh, than with the AP system. So as as in, as, as uh, Ankur mentioned, uh, this system for us sits on top of our uh, ERP. Uh, in, in my mind, the biggest function of our ERP is it has to house your accounting. Uh, like like it's, it's always sometimes gets very gray how some of these tools can be called ERP or not. In my mind, anything which runs your core accounting is ERP. And then of course, some of those ERPs are very narrow to run only your core accounting. Some of them get far broader to run every other function around it. Uh, we have continued to run our reconciliations of the ERP, uh, which for us today is tally, which we're moving to something else now in the near term. <laughs> uh, but that process continues for us in that manner. I think the only one change is now that we have a three-way matching uh, because POs are raised on the system um uh invoices are also uploaded on the system and because we are integrated with our warehouse management system every time goods are received they are also pushed into the same system and that three way matching happens if at all there is a payment which has not been made that gets flagged if it's been if it slipped through the cracks right that the relevant business team did not raise the payment request to wo flag ho jata hai so that should ideally lead to a reduction in uh, discrepancies um uh, but I think it's too early for me to say that we've actually seen it leading to a reduction. But logically, we should see some uh, delta coming from there. But the core process of reconciliation, we've not changed. Yeah. And just to add, uh, I think what we've seen across some of the you know, other clients, which are a little more mature also, is that um, in many ways, uh, the actual reconciliation process with vendors now is almost a near redundant activity because of all the controls that are in place 
both at the invoice booking stage where you know the po gr and invoice necessarily you know end up getting sort of reconciled and finally even every single payment that has been made uh, is you know immediately reconciled in real time um very rarely have we seen clients having mismatched ledgers with their vendors as a result of these checks and balances that are part of the ap process itself right so uh, the room for mismatches itself comes down dramatically over time Super. Thanks. Uh, thanks, Mr. Sanjay. Uh, thanks, Ankur. Thanks, Yanesh. Uh, Radhika, do you want to move on to the next question? Yeah. So the next question that we have uh, is uh, being one of the older customers, can you talk about the transition and the journey you embarked on with cash flow? And We're having some tech issues here. Yeah, uh, read the question. But it's, yeah. It's out here. Uh, so, uh, uh, let me just for the audience's sake, right? Like, uh, being an early customer of Cashflow, can you talk uh, about the transition and the journey you embarked on with Cashflow and how users adopted uh, to the new systems and processes in place, especially in the context of a fast paced startup? Uh, are AP teams more welcoming to the change uh, in a bit to automate? Uh, so, in our case, I think our AP team was very happy to automate. Because it was just going out of hand to track each and every one. And, and the problem with this is if you're doing 1000 payments a month, even if you do 99% of them correctly on time, or 1% slips, that 1% is still 10. 10 a month is one in three days, which is a very large number, right? By itself. Like every three days you have a vendor who's not getting paid. Uh, that's a that's a very large number. So, uh, and of course, the flack for this goes back to the finance team, right? payment <laughs> whatever else, uh, even though there might be an external good reason for it sometimes. Like, um, so I think having the system is great. Again, from a uh, compliance perspective also, like manually checking, okay, approvals are in place for all thousand. And, and that's a very critical check, right? Tomorrow, there cannot be a scenario that we have payment kar diya and the relevant person has not approved it. Um, uh, as long as it's manual, it's always gone on the head of finance, right? Okay, your duty to check as much as it is manual, not just check. Then you have to check and make sure that this person is not the approval authority, hai ki hai. Uh, which is another uh, thing, right? And there could be n number of different authorities available with n number of different people. So for all of this to go away into a hard-coded system, which confirms all the checks, it's well, very good for finance. So I think they were quite gungo. Of course, they had to do a lot of heavy lifting in the early bit to get this off the ground, but quite gungo. For the business teams, as I had mentioned, there was there was some resistance because nothing beats the convenience of writing a two-line email asking for uh, something to be done, right? That's just the best ever uh, uh, from a convenience perspective. Not doesn't meet all the other criteria, but convenience the tops uh, there. So uh, there was some resistance, but but I think people obviously at the end of the day, you have people who are mature and understand the implication as to why you are doing what you're doing, what is the benefit it leads to. Uh, it also helps them, right? Because now they have visibility on uh, uh, payment statuses, uh, what is getting stuck, what is not, etc. So there's also that benefit available for them. So now we're pretty streamlined with the few teams that have adopted the uh, product um, compared to where we were earlier. Super. Thanks. Thanks for that, Dhanesh. Um, the next question is... Um... I like how you mentioned uh, the fact that data results in more predictability. Can you tell us a bit about your FP and A pro? Tell you, can you tell us a bit about how your FP and A processes have changed or evolved with the availability of data? <laughs> so, as I was mentioning earlier, in our specific case, we used to actually maintain this data already. Uh, what goes into our planning? So, so how how do you plan? You look at past data. That past data gets used along with some business insight to predict future data. Effectively, that's that's broadly the uh, a very boring way of looking at what planning is. Uh, uh, but it's actually what planning is. As, as much as boring, that's actually how planning works. Uh, in our case, we did maintain this, this kind of data and granularity. The only difference is a lot of it was on spreadsheets. Uh, our, our accounting system had the data 
but our accounting system did not have the kind of user friendliness and granularity in output to give us those cuts. So a lot of it used to just get like, uh, as a company, we run a gazillion spreadsheets. Uh, and in one of those is where this used to be. Now it just gets a little more organized and an accuracy of the data is at least not in question. Uh, the moment you are running stuff on spreadsheets and and a, a large number of those spreadsheets, you know that na kidhar error hone wala hai. Uh, it's only human. Uh, so that confidence on the data just goes up with this for us. Got it. Got it. Got it. Uh, okay, last question before we wrap it up uh, is um, how much of your AP team's bandwidth went into these day-to-day -day struggles previously, right? With vendor queries, with audit and other processes. Um, and has cash flow actually been able to alleviate some of these issues and free bandwidth across functions, right? like procurement, finance, risk. Um, so yeah, what has the impact been there? So as I mentioned, I don't think, uh, I think the the uh, the manual process, while it doesn't necessarily have an infinitely higher uh, time required, I think the, it has very high irritants because it's all manual. Someone will... Say, Are, mujhe ye chahiye, what is the status of this? Iska UTR de do. Someone will ask, ye kidhar atka hai? Each of those things, it actually takes only one or two minutes to check. Aisa nahi hai ki it's a day long task for someone to check that. The problem is, it is so unstructured that it becomes a very massive irritant. Like, I think people operate very well if there is clarity on and consistency on what you need to do when. These small, tiny darts that keep coming in the middle of the day from anywhere and everywhere. Uh, koi WhatsApp pe puchega, koi Slack message karega, someone will email, someone will call, someone will come over your shoulder and say, wo bata yaar, uska kya hua, and so on and so forth. It's just, I, I just think it doesn't, it's very disturbing. Uh, so I think that part just moves away to having transparency on the system, uh, which helps. I'm not, I'm still not sure as I was mentioning, how much will it change productivity versus just give people more transparent peace of mind in how they operate. Yeah, got it. Just to sort of add there, uh, you know, the I think the way we all think about productivity also sometimes is very uh, like you know how many minutes or how many hours saved, but it's also the context switching, right? You know, you get drained faster if you're having to constantly handle multiple queries which are not part of your planned you know day, and that leads to you know people getting just more tired and you know not being as you know focused and productive in their day to day work. Uh, I think those are some of the intangibles of productivity, which, um, you know, yeah. when you start uh, limiting the amount of context switching uh, that happens, uh, automatically their focus on the four areas starts improving. So hard to quantify, but I imagine that's also, uh, you know, plays towards productivity uh, for people. Yeah. And you also mentioned auditors. Uh, I think it's also great. I mean, auditors would have appreciated the fact that now you have a, a relatively foolproof system in place for this because if you're running into crores and crores every month going through the system that has given it, it should give them comfort versus an otherwise manual uh, uh, setup which was there so far mm -hmm. yeah okay um Morel, uh we have a question from another uh, guest here but uh, we're just being a little bit mindful of time as well uh, so what we'll do is we'll uh, post this uh, post this question to both Dhyanesh and Ankur separately and get back to you uh, after uh, after the webinar, right? I think uh, just being mindful of everyone's time. Uh, I think it's been a fantastic session like today. Um, got a lot of insight into uh, into finance automation definitely, but also uh, you know like uh, I think it's been it's been a a new perspective has been introduced in the sense that like finance automation doesn't only have to sort of, you know, um, enhance, let's say, the AP function or the AR function or uh, these tools, which essentially help, like, you know, day-to-day -day tactical uh, improvements and processes. But uh, the availability of data, the uh, the accuracy of the data, uh, the up-to-dateness of the data uh, also helps us in uh, better financial planning and analysis. So I think that's been a, that's been a great insight. Um, Dhyanesh, thanks a lot for your time. I think, uh, you know, fantastic having you, having you over and to share your insights of, you know, growing a business zero to one, one to 10, 
uh, and uh, we'd love to have you over uh, again you know like in the future at some point and uh, you know like as as mazai grows i'm sure there'll be more insights to share as well so thanks a lot for your time ankur thanks a lot for your time as well uh, and uh, um, yeah thanks a lot to everyone who joined the joined the webinar today if you have any questions uh, any counter questions please feel free to share them with us via email uh, and we will be sharing a recording of this webinar as well uh, by by tomorrow or day after with everyone uh, who joined today so thanks a lot again everyone thank you so much akshay thank you so much ganesh it was an you know incredibly insightful conversations really appreciate it um and and yeah i hope to speak soon yeah bye, bye. okay take care bye bye